Hi guys, it's Miss Osborne back again with another review PowerPoint looking at Jacksonian democracy today and social reforms from about 1824 to 1840. As you watch the video, make sure that you're answering the guided questions that are provided. It's okay if you have to pause or rewatch the video in order to answer the guided questions. After the video ends, make sure that you summarize in paragraph form the main points of the video using the vocabulary provided. Finish by asking one question, either something that you're so confused about, a general question, or a discussion question that you can bring to the back to the class. The essential questions that we're going to look at um, in this video are how did Jacksonian democracy and Jackson's presidency affect American government and society, and how did different reform and social movements affect American society? Andrew Jackson became president in 1824, and he quickly became known as the common man's president because of his principle of Jacksonian democracy. Jacksonian democracy was characterized by the belief in the common man. He really represented the beliefs of the people. Jackson is famous because he was one of the first presidents to actually throw a huge party at the White House and invite all the people to it. He also expanded voting rights for men. He removed the property requirement. Previous to this, there had been a property requirement requiring people who wanted to vote to own a certain amount of property. This kept poor farmers from voting. He also started the system of patronage. This is also known as the spoil system. He started a policy of placing political supporters into office. He had a huge opposition to privileged elites. He did not believe that the privileged people should have any more right to government than the common man. The tariffs of 1816 and 1828 were passed in order to protect American trade. Again, these tariffs are taxes on imported goods. The southern states referred to these tariffs as the tariff of abomination. John C. Calhoun, who was a strong advocate of states' rights, he was from South Carolina, came up with the doctrine of nullification. The state had the right to refuse to recognize an act of Congress. It essentially said any law that they didn't agree with, they didn't have to follow. Daniel Webster, in the famous webster hayne debate, forcefully rejected the idea of nullification. And Andrew Jackson also came out against nullification. Nullification would allow the states to not enforce any law that they didn't see as constitutional. Jackson vigorously opposed the bill to recharter the Second Bank of the United States. He believed that the bank used its special privileges to help the rich and hurt the common man. He wanted to support the common man, and by doing that, he wanted to get rid of the National Bank. Jackson supported the removal of the money from the National pet Bank to pet banks, or what he called state banks. Each state and state bank began issuing its own currency. Out of the veto of the National Bank, the Whig Party emerged because they were in opposition to vetoing the National Bank, and so they were in opposition to Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson is also famous for his removal of the Native American tribes from the East Coast. In the Supreme Court case, Worcester versus Georgia, the United States Supreme Court upheld the rights of the Cherokee tribe to their tribal lands. Andrew Jackson famously said, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. John Marshall was the Supreme Court Chief Justice. He had no ability to enforce that law. That was up to the executive branch, and at the top of the executive branch was President Jackson. The Indian Removal Act resulted in the removal of the Cherokee from their homeland to settlements on the other side of the Mississippi. These settlements become known as the reservation system. The Trail of Tears refers to the route taken by Native Americans as they were relocated to the Indian Territory of Oklahoma. About a third of the Cherokee people died on the Trail of Tears. Cotton was the South's primary crop, so much so that the South became known as King Cotton. The invention of the cotton gin made it possible and profitable to harvest cotton. It produced cotton at a higher rate and also made it less expensive to make. The addition of territories in the Deep South, mainly from the Louisiana Purchase, opened more land for cotton moving slavery southward and westward. As the East Coast filled up population-wise, people started moving out west in hopes for more farmland. Great Britain had the largest demand for cotton and would be one of the greatest allies for the South. 
The majority of white males in the South, however, were small yeoman farmers, meaning that they only farmed enough to pretty much serve their family, rather than wealthy plantation owners. The majority of white families didn't even own any slaves. During Jackson's presidency, there was also a transportation revolution. The Erie Canal connected the inner United States to the Atlantic Ocean. Canals became a very popular way to open waterways into the inside of the United States. Canals helped to open trade in the western part of the United States. In the picture to the right, you can see that the Erie Canal, which is what's marked in red, connected Chicago all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, making it a very popular trade route. Steamboats also became widely used in the 1820s and 1830s because they allowed ships to travel up and down the Mississippi River. Previous to this, ships would be built out of wood and then dismantled at the bottom of the Mississippi River and carried back upstream or sold for lumber. The first railroad also appeared in the United States in 1828. By 1860, there were over 30,000 miles of track, including the transcontinental railroad that connected the East Coast and the West Coast. Railroads enabled farmers in the Midwest easier access to urban markets in the East. The women's rights movement focused on a broad base of legal and educational rights. However, they mainly focused on the right to vote. The movement is mainly led by middle class women. Middle class women tended to be more educated. The Seneca Falls Convention was organized and led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott in 1848. At the convention, the women famously passed the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions. The Declaration lined up with the Declaration of Independence as far as the grievances that the women felt against men. At the convention, the women in attendance called for the women's right to vote, hold property, and have equal educational rights as men. Traditionally, women did not have the right to vote. If they had any property, that property technically belonged to their husband, their father, or their closest male relative. Women traditionally did not go to college or have any sort of formal education. The Second Great Awakening was a wave of religious enthusiasm that put an emphasis on the believer's access to God. It emphasized that every man could be saved. This was really popular with all people, especially African Americans. The Second Great Awakening played an important role making Americans aware of the moral issues that were posed by slavery. William Lloyd Garrison, in his magazine, The Liberator, called for the immediate and uncompensated emancipation of the slaves. There were some abolitionists that only called for the gradual emancipation of slaves. Frederick Douglass was the most prominent black abolitionist and a champion of equal rights for all. He famously wrote the biography of Frederick Douglass after spending many years in slavery. The Grimke sisters were one of the first women to support abolition and women's rights. Transcendentalism was a philo philosophical and literary movement of the 1800s that emphasized living simple, celebrating the truth found in nature and personal emotion, and civil disobedience. The most famous of the literature writers during the Transcendentalist movement were Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Both of these writers are famous for living off the grid and making a life for themselves outside of society. Utopian societies also developed during this idea because they time period because they wanted to create a perfect society. They thought that humans had the capacity to achieve a better life outside of the um, normal social means. The best known community were Brook Farm, New Harmony, and Oneida. These communities sought to escape the competitiveness of American life, to regulate moral behavior, and create cooperative lifestyles. Other cultural advances during this time period was that Horace Mann from Massachusetts introduced compulsory public education. This meant that all children would have to go to school. He then spread that movement throughout the United States by founding teacher education schools to train teachers to teach. The Hudson River School is also important during this time period because this was the first um, amount of nationalist art or art that depicted the um, national landscape of the United States. The group of artists is led by Thomas Cole, who painted landscape emphasizing America's natural beauty. Don't forget to answer the guided questions. If you missed one, make sure that you watch the video, watch the video again, pausing where you need to. 
Once you feel like you have a good understanding of the video, summarize it in paragraph form using the bolded and underlined words or the specific vocabulary used on your WSQ. Then finish by asking one question that's either a confusion question, a question about the general topic, or a discussion question that you can bring to the class. Thank you for joining me again for this review video. We're looking forward to seeing you again soon.